Hi, this is Dick DeAngelis, and welcome to another episode of Inside Fairfield History. I'm the director of the Fairfield History series, and we do these interviews throughout our community. This one is with Gary Nelson. Not only does he paint people's homes around town, but he's an artifact hunter, one of about 20 that I got to meet, who really understand the creeks and streams and fields of this area and, and the back areas and, and who used to live here before we did, and sometimes dating all the way back thousands of years. And he finds artifacts, little signs of what used to be here. I think you're going to love this interview. I know I did. Here's Gary Nelson. I've been hunting arrowheads for about 36 years and uh, started, out, started out hunting fields and after the fields got depleted then we started moving to the cr cricks and streams and finding up to 15 arrowheads in one hunt which is usually pretty rare but uh, and then gradually accumulated in 36 years 4,000 arrowheads and close to 150 tomahawks or axes so that was that was a start. Uh, one, of the first, one of the first things that got me started doing this was I, was I was farming with a farmer and I would spot the arrowheads from up on the tractor and get out and pick them up and was just fascinated with the workmanship on the arrowheads. And um, one day I went out and found two axes and three arrowheads and ran all the way across the countryside with these axes in my pockets and I, and I uh, went and see, seen my dad and he looked down at my pockets and seen the outline of these axes and I pulled them out and showed them to him. So that, that's really what got me hooked and addicted on hunting artifacts. <laughs> Back when my dad used to hunt artifacts and stuff, uh, they would just skip them across the pond because they'd be walking out in the field and he was a trapper and, and if he caught a coyote in a trap, he would end up seeing the arrowhead where the coyote went in a circle and then it would rain and the arrowheads would be showing up on the dirt in the dirt. So he was able to go out and find arrowheads and they didn't have any meaning back in the day. So they would they just uh, skipped them across the pond and and then later you know 20 years go by and everybody starts to collect them and 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 quite a, a high price on them which we never did sell we just document and do it his, for historical purposes. Uh, that way we can study them, study them later, in later years. We used to own some land outside of Fairfield a little ways, and oh, my dad was probably 20 years old, and he told me a story about when, when he was trapping muskrats on a swampy bottom area, and there was kind of a little bluff off to the side, and he got to investigating and looking around at this bluff and found a really nice cave tucked back in, and this was outside of Fairfield, and it had, he said it had petroglyphs. There were writings all over this cave and pictures of stick horses and, 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 it, and there was all kinds of meaning. And, and my dad, being a young guy and, and uh, wanted to tell, you know, was so excited about his find and finding these petroglyphs that he, he started talking about it. And he started telling people and my dad at that time worked at Whitney Monument, so he could have got the tools and defaced the whole thing and they could have put this in a museum. But instead, the wrong people heard about it and they went in with chisels and hammers and actually ruined history. Anyway, the thing with my dad, he felt really bad about it and it could have told a story about, um, you know, why the area, because Fairfield's more of a plains area, it's flatter. and it could have told why, you know, it just could have told a lot of history. It could have told about the plants, the wildlife, and, and the, uh, the way of living, you know, at that time. 
So he, he was pretty heartbroken about the whole thing. And, and since then, years went by, uh, archaeologists went down and were able to save some history and, and piece together some stories. So that, that really helped. A lot of times my friends will ask me why I'm not out hunting. And I'll say, well, I haven't really had any calling, any dreams or anything yet. A lot of times I'll go out and uh, right off the bat, think you're going to go to a place in, in your car and you think you're going to pull over and all of a sudden you, your, your, your car takes you somewhere else and you just end up at another creek or another field and you jump out and instantly when you get out in this field or creek start finding stuff. A lot of times if you find an arrowhead right off the bat, uh, the best thing to do is just go back up to your truck and go home because I, many a times, probably over 100, 200 times, I've went out, you find one right off the bat, really nice big arrowhead, something that might look like this, a nice big dovetail or something, and your adrenaline, you're just pumping, your adrenaline's going and you're all excited, and then you go out and you hunt all day thinking you're going to find more of these, and this is once in a lifetime, which you just found as soon as you got out of the car, so I just learned Learn to follow your in instinct and also just, just feel, just kind of feel where they might be that day. It's, a lot of times you'll have an answer. This is, this is a, about a four and a quarter inch dovetail. I don't know if you can see it really good from there. And uh, it's, it's basically a well-made survival knife. And a lot of times when you tip it at an angle, you can see the workmanship. And they had a very broad base and they called it a dovetail because of this, the, the back of the, the base is shaped like a dove's tail. And it was broad based that way that they could haft it. They could use it as a knife this way. They could shoot it with their bow and arrow. They could use an atlatl thrower with, with the weight and, and use an atlatl thrower on it and, and take out uh, uh, bison with this. But mainly it's a knife. And it's just amazing how well, well worked it is. And this is one of the top three artifacts that people will just die for when they're out hunting. Sometimes when you're going down the road, if you know what you're looking for, like, like certain areas will be really flat. Then you'll go down like toward Kiyosakwa and start getting into valleys and creek valleys. You'll see a bridge. That's a good place to go up and hunt arrowheads. And you'll just, you'll just see the lay of the land and good arrowhead hunting areas are usually very hilly because the water, the water was up, the Paleo Indians were in, then the archaic, the archaic period as the water was settling, and then the woodland time zone. And um, you can see, you can see the different elevations. Like in 1993, the flood of 93, that water level got back up and got up out of the river bank, the Des Moines River. And that was basically where the Indians, they were on the edge of that. So when the water got up in 93 and started working the sides of those banks, it was nothing to walk into a field and find 150 arrowheads laying out there, just exposed, just waiting to be picked up. And once again, instead of letting them set out there, document what field, name the field, use the farmer's name, and uh, do, do it that way because if, if you leave them out there, then somebody's going to get in the, on the tractor and get in the disc and just chop all that stuff up. And you might have a big blade that's ceremonial and you don't want it bro broke into pieces. And um, just the lay of, lay of the land really helps you be able to spot the areas that you want to hunt the artifacts in. When man came across and uh, the water levels were up really high, Paleo Indian came in in canoes and they were camping up high. Usually these artifacts were found up high, but then later when the, when the glacial period, the water receded and got into the river banks of today, then whenever I'm going down these streams and you find one, you're basically, you're, a, a Clovis point, if you can find one embedded in a woolly mammoth leg bone or a, a scapula or a muskox skull from the Pleistocene period, if you can find a Clovis point embedded into that bone, we could actually date, date back how long ago people really did come across the Bering Straits and get, get to the, the United States and, 
and settling in on our campsites and camping in the area. Um, and they liked it because back in, back in the day, the reason an Indian could wear moccasins was because it was warmer in the winter and it was nicer in the summer. So people always wonder, how can it, why didn't an Indian's feet, why wouldn't he just freeze to death? His feet would just freeze. It was much nicer back then in the, in the winter time. So in Jefferson County, and I, have, I haven't checked this out, but I'm not sure what the elevation is, um, because you usually won't find a hardened point, a hardened arrowhead, which is, even though it's a tie-on arrowhead that they tied on, it's got side notches, you usually won't find one of these down mid-range or low area. You'll find them up high because that's getting up there. This is 9,000 year old arrowhead. This is the oldest known arrowhead that's a tie-on. So anyway, outside of Fairfield, I discovered a, discovered a campsite that's mid-range level, not high, not low, and found a hardened point. And which, which leads me to believe that probably Fairfield's way higher than it looks. So if you project where you're at at Fairfield straight on across to Kiyosakwa, you're probably going to be close to three-fourths the way on a bluff. Up, it, it's, it's higher elevation than people would think. So it's something that a person needs to check out is elevation when you're out hunting artifacts too. That'll help out a lot. Sometimes you get, get a real vibe. Um, you know, I had said before, um, you'll get like a calling or you'll be laying in bed and you'll think, get out of bed and get out in a creek and, and you'll head to a certain place. Um, one day I went out, one day I went out to uh, Morris Park. It's in Jefferson County. And I was able to walk down in a big, a big creek and it was big lime rock and a lot of hunters don't like the big limestone because it's hard to see. And, but there was sand and I had found I had found an axe, a grooved axe in that creek before. And I looked down and this thing, this thing was coated with like a crick, kind of crick slime basically. And you could really just see the outline of this big artifact. This is a scraper, a scraper blade. I imagine uh, with the workmanship that we have on this blade and the big flaking and the really detailed uh, uh, percussion marks and secondary pecking on this artifact that this was either a scalping blade or just a really nice buffalo skinning blade and it wasn't too far from where I found the axe two years before and I've got over 5,000 hits on this artifact because it was just it was so when I cleaned it off it just had all these different colors and bands of material and just the big flake workmanship. A super nice piece. I'm a painter, I've been painting for 35 years, so I'm breathing fumes and dust and sheetrock dust. And I get out on a weekend, I go out with Magistrate Judge Steve Small. He hunts with me about every Sunday. And we go out and we just, we just talk and, and you just breathe good fresh air and you just let these artifacts come to you or, or sometimes you're just out hiking. You know, if you don't have a good day, it's still the best day ever. So just being able to get out and when you do find something and you document where it was at and that'll help history, that, that'll help be, be able to tell a story, especially with the Clovis points. For an, an artifact hunter, one of the Holy Grail pieces is a Clovis point. It dates back 13,500 years old. It, it's DNA testing is how they dated back from 13, which was a carbon test. 2135 with DNA. And the Clovis point has a flute in it. A friend of mine found one and he was offered $15,000 for it. I found four of them and they're just a once in a lifetime piece and unbelievable. And mine was found nowhere near a creeks or rivers or anywhere. Just it, I happened to go out and walk down a stream and found one sticking out and pulled it out of the bank and it had the flute in it and I just went crazy. So uh, another time I took my six wheel Argo and I went down Fox River and I had a friend with me and he walked up around the rock bar and, and he walked past a Clovis point and I picked it up and he just wanted to kill me. So that was a super, super nice little Clovis point and they're just, they're just historically 
really, really something when you find when you find one. I don't like to take people to my honey hole, my favorite places to, to hunt artifacts. I like to take them to a neutral place. And as luck would have it, and I would take a girl, girlfriend or whatever, or just a girlfriend. <laughs> so anyway, and I and I would and I would say, you take this side of the dirt road and I'll take this side and we're going to walk up and it goes up high. So the road grader grades this dirt road and at the top of this road, it's four foot down. So it, if they didn't grade it with the road grader, it would just be straight across at the very high peak. So they're cutting through a campsite, pushing artifacts down this dirt road. So my girlfriend, sta she starts on one side, I start on the other side. And we're walking along and we get about, I don't know, we, we went about a hundred yards and something told me, you better just walk over behind her in case she might be missing something. And as soon as I walked behind her, this is, this is the ax that, that I seen. But when I seen it, it was covered up. The road grader had went, went across this ax and covered the groove, but left, but left both sides of it. Let's see if I can show you here left both sides of it, so it looked like a rock here and a rock here. So I told my girlfriend, I said, I know I wasn't supposed to come over onto your side of the dirt road, but uh, are you gonna pick that ax up that's laying there? And she goes, get back over there on your side. So anyway, she sat there and looked and looked and looked and could not see this ax. So I just took my finger and pushed across this groove on this ax. And then she seen the groove and says, oh, it's mine, it's mine, it was on my side. Well, as time, time goes by, I end up with it anyway. She got an apartment and she couldn't have her Yorkies there, so she says, you take the Yorkie and keep my Yorkie and I'll give you the ax back. So here it is, it came to me anyway. <laughs> One other time, we're going up the dirt road, different girlfriend, several years after, and we almost get to the top and I'm telling her the story about Angie finding this ax, which probably didn't make her too happy. So going up this dirt road, we're almost three fourths of the way to the top. And she just starts yelling, look at this ax. And she pulled out a bigger size, bigger size ax. This isn't the ax, but this is close to the size that she found. And she was just ecstatic and she, and she goes, come and look, come and look. And I said, don't, don't touch it, don't touch it. You know, I want to do pictures of it, I want to do a movie of it. And she pulled it out and it was an ax about this big. Beautiful groove, she still has it. I couldn't talk her out of it. So this dirt road, this not too far from where we're doing this movie has really produced a lot of nice stuff. And about a quarter mile from here, 35 years ago, I walked out onto a field and I picked up a whole bunch of arrowheads right when I just started hunting arrowheads and I picked up 15 arrowheads. I seen something laying on the ground that was round here and came out to a point down here and I call it a caveman club. Well, I didn't know much about the artifacts then. I started buying books and learning about this stuff. It was actually a big grinder, pest. it was a pestle. So I didn't want to carry this big heavy pestle because I'm bending over picking up all these artifacts. So I seen a, a road tube going through the trees and then there was water at the other end of the road tube. It's where tractors went through when they farmed the, the field. I just took that big pestle and threw it down in the water. If we were to go there right now, and this has been, I've been thinking about this a lot in the last half a year, take a prod and prod down in the ground, I would be able to pull out my, what I called my, my uh, big, the big pestle. It was my caveman club. So. Then about a half a year after I found it, I started hunting this dirt road that I was talking about. I get up in this field, and it looked like a big rock, and I flipped it over, and it was this beautiful dipped out grinding bowl. And you can just almost picture them kneeling down next to it because it's really smooth on this edge. And you could just picture them just working that and grinding corn. So I've got four of these. I got one that's bigger than this. And they're pretty rare because all the big stuff gets found first. So all the axes will show up first. And then, and then some of the fields that you don't find artifacts in, you will find little bird points, little, real little inch arrowheads in it. And then there's a lot of fields that I've already picked everything up and it might rain four times, you might find one arrowhead. 
back in the day you would find five axes and 50 arrowheads in one day. So you can deplete, deplete a field by hunting and hunting and hunting because the farmers only go so far down. And then if you get somebody in there with a John Deere tractor that sinks the shanks down way deeper, they pull up older stuff and more artifacts start coming up again. That, that dirt road has been just such a, such a nice place to take people and, and it overlooks a low valley area and you're, you go up high, you can just picture the Indians living up high and when you go there, there's, ch there's chips of flint where they sat there and made arrowheads and there's, um, you know, of course the axes that we found on it. It's just a super neutral spot to take people. It's really fun. So behind us we have a big bluff right here and it's approximately 60, 80 foot tall. If you, if you go down Skunk River, there's no other bluffs north of here anywhere. So you might say that this is the beginning of, uh, of, a, of an old bluff area and, and then that's where you get Indians that'll have, probably, there's probably grave, Indian graves up above here because and campsites on out in and if there's a field there and and they till across it there will be artifacts in it um, there's cabins up there right now so so white man loved to be able to get up high and overlook and see people coming and and just a beautiful view as well as the indians they love to be up high if they had another tribe coming into their area they would be able to see them coming and then, that, then the warriors could go out and uh, chase them away so if it was a, a bad type, of, you know, bad Indians. So what I, what I see when I see this bluff, knowing that two miles down the road there's another bluff and some people had, had built a house in the side of a bluff like this and when they did they got into a cave and that cave was approximately from the end, end of the bluff um, where they built that house, they got into a cave and they used that as their fruit cellar, but they also found pottery and axes and arrowheads, so they put a big display case in there and showed beautiful axes. And I remember 30 years ago seeing they, they were just black, jet black axes. They were beautiful. They were ceremonial. They were polished completely. So when I see a bluff like this, and, and I actually discovered a cave up in this one about halfway up. Well, knowing that there's a cave in this one and there's there's a uh, hundred foot to the end of this and then there's the river, go a mile on the other side, there was a cave in that one the same distance from that end to there on another bluff. So the Indians, you know, it was easy for them to find them if they were in equal caves were equal distance apart from the ends of the, of the bluff. So, I mean, that's what I see. And then knowing that there was a buffalo kill site um, down the river, uh, Anton Teal, he, he, he likes to go out and boat and pick up these buffalo skulls and they'll find arrowheads embedded in the skull. Um, that tells me that they could take these, they, they could chase these buffalo around on this bluff and chase them off off the top of a big bluff like this and 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 they they could uh do a kill a kill there by chasing them off the bluff because it would kill them when they fell plus they'd be wounded and the indians would you know uh take the hides and use the hides and the bones and every piece of the buffalo would be used unlike today where you just cut the loins out and eat the loins and and uh some of the meat and then just let it waste. The Indians never wasted anything. And I'm kind of walking in their shoes in a roundabout way. I mean, I'm just, you know, I, I, I go out in a tree stand and set from five in the morning and you're sitting there freezing and you're, you're waiting just like they would wait when they were hunting. And uh, my dad's a trapper. I used to trap, but I do more bow hunting now. And uh, you just learn to respect the way of the Indian um, uh, being able to walk in their shoes and, uh, and find their artifacts. A lot of these flood areas, uh, like Lake Darling, whenever they drained Lake Darling, you could walk out there, you could find the campfire ring with the charcoal in it, and, and it would be almost like 
when that when they drained that lake, it was almost like the Indians were down over the hill and you walked up to their campsite because there's a big pile of flint chips where they were making arrowheads. There's a ring of fire with the charcoal still in it. There's axes laying there. There's arrowheads over here. And it just it, it just puts you right right in their right in their camp with them, basically. So yeah, it's it's super to be able to to get out and breathe the air, see the same trees, the same rivers and and just li live the Indian life, basically. I love it.